is Dr. Jenny Yi from uh, Lawrence Beck National Laboratory in the Department of Physics of California, Berkeley. And she tells about the HW method, the introduction to the HW, the Bunsen heater equation method, and the HW perturbation theory. Okay, thank you, Manos. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks uh, to everyone. And uh, I would first like also to thank the Professor Justino and the organizer for inviting me. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here to uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the Berkeley GW and the GW approach oh, to hide that. Okay. Sorry for that. Oh, yeah, here you go. Hi. And then, yeah. Okay. Right. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to give an introduction to the GW and uh, GW beta solubility equation method first, uh, mostly, and so that uh, you will do the practice this afternoon and the hackathon uh, over the weekend. And also briefly talk about the GW perturbation theory, which is a recent development. <clears throat> So when we talk about materials properties, we would, we, we've seen a lot already this week and uh, especially on electron phonon coupling. So uh, many of the properties are, can be, I mean, the, the properties basically can be grouped into ground state properties or excited states property. And for ground state property, we have seen already uh, total energy structures, magnetization and vibrations. This is a little tricky, but the vibration we're talking about this week are based on DFT and DFPT. So they are based on ground state theory. So I put them in the ground state properties here. <clears throat> there are other a, a large class of properties of materials that are actually very useful and important are called the excited state properties. And this is often related, uh, uh, relevant to the spectroscopy, experimental spectroscopies that uh, one can do measurement on, on the materials. So uh, we can, under the excited states properties, we have single particle excitation, two particle excitation, and so on. And uh, today we're gonna focus on this two part. And the single particle excitations usually we talk about uh, the uh, excited states, or in the many body language, we call it the uh, M plus one problem. So that means we have one extra uh, quasi particle being excited. And this is uh, closely uh, uh, related to the photo emission or angle result photo emission processes, tunneling, for example, if you do an STM experiment. And this is also related to the band gap problem that we have seen that uh, DFT is. Uh, uh, or Cosham DLT is having some uh, uh, issues with that. So these problems can be well described by the so-called the GW method. And for the two particle excitation, we call it, we call it the M plus two problem. And this is relevant to the optical responses. And this is also uh, important uh, uh, excitation called the excitons, which dominate a lot of the optical processes and other processes. And this can be well described by the so-called the GW beta subpeter equation approach that we're gonna talk about today. So um, let's uh, go to the single particle first and let, let's see, uh, take a look that the, if we wanna compute the excited states phenomena of materials, what uh, method at hand we have at hand. So uh, we can definitely do DFT. But keep in mind that DFT is a ground state theory. So if you want to use DFT to describe excited states problem, it's a, uh, it's a drastic approximation. And uh, what DFT does effectively for the Cauchy orbitals is that the orbitals can be seen as a bare electron moving in an average potential. Uh, uh, it's seeing an average potential coming out from all the other electrons and the ions. So this averaged potential in DFT, uh, Cosham DFT is called the exchange correlation potential. Uh, as Professor Justino actually has mentioned that it's a local static potential. And uh, this is in fact, not a true effective potential seen by a quasi-particle excitation in material. Whereas uh, in the material, a true quasi-particle excitation can be seen as a dressed electron. So uh, it is uh, interacting uh, with all other electrons in a complicated way. And uh, you can form some kind of the concept of the electron cloud looking uh, here and it acquires a lifetime. So that's uh, what we really refer to a quasi particle. And uh, the GW method can do this job. And uh, the GW method uh, is uh, uh, its own, is an excited state theory. And the key quantity that actually we already have seen 
uh, in this school is to describe this uh, uh, complicated uh, excited states property for single particle is the self energy. So this self energy basically it includes all the magnetron correlations. So the problem now is uh, is just to how we can do approximation to compute or calculate the self energy. So that's a goal. So the GW method is one of the approximation that works pretty well for electron part of the self energy. And we see that this operator is non-local. It has two position indices and it's frequency dependent. So these all create the uh, complications of the method, but it's more uh, accurate for excited states properties. So in particular, the G here is a Green's function and W is a screen column interaction. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's a non-local and frequency dependent potential. So uh, here's a, a very nice uh, illustration of the uh, quasi-particle effect in, in a very nice review of modern physics paper on the angle result photo emission spectroscopy. So uh, this is a particularly uh, probing mainly for one particle, uh, the n plus one problem. So when we shine light into the material, we can yen an electron out. So that's a photo emission process. And uh, uh, in the angle result photo emission, technique, we can uh, also get the momentum information of the, the electron coming out from the material so that we can actually get a very nice momentum versus energy uh, relationship. So that's usually what we call the band structure. Uh, so basically, it gives you the band structure, but it's actually giving you the spectral function of the single particle excitation. So if we have a non-interacting system and we want to theoretically compute the dispersion, uh, for example, for a simple metal, it could be just a line uh, across the Fermi energy. And if you look at its spectral function, there'll be just a bunch of delta functions that uh, with the energy uh, located at the uh, uh, non-interacting electron excitation energies and the peak width is basically zero. However, when you do an experiment on the real material, what you will see is that uh, they are not well, it could can be sharp peaks, but they have finite width. And also there are other structures. So these behavior actually represent that uh, the quasi-particle many-body effect within the material. So if we compare a interacting electron uh, theory to a non-interacting electron theory, what we see is that three effects. So one is that there could be a energy shift uh, between the non-interacting eigenvalue and the quasi-particle excitation energy, and the peak will be broadened. And also there are other structures, the satellite features that we're already seeing in the electron photon coupling uh, sense already. So this can be captured by the quantity, the complex quantity uh, sigma. And for the energy shift, it's coming from the real part of the uh, self-energy and uh, the real part and the imagined part together will give you the basically the spectral function, which is a function of both the K space and also the frequency that give you all these rich features of an quasi-particle excitation. So uh, now we come to how we do the approximation and uh, what does it mean to, uh, for the self-energy? Actually, there are many different types of self-energy. And uh, as I, I took this nice image from Professor Justino's slides and uh, uh, we can see that uh, we can have electron-electron interaction that induce a self-energy. And we have talked a lot, a lot about the electron phono self-energy. And uh, basically, if we look at the diagram, we can have the three diagrams that, refer that represent different contributions in different forms. So we've already discussed a lot the, uh, the, the two here, which are relevant to the electron phono self-energy. And today, we're going to look at the first diagram so that we can have a more complete description of the uh, self-energy uh, behavior. So uh, if you look at this diagram, uh, so we see that we have the Green's function and we have the W, the screen cooling interaction that coming from the electronic contribution. And we have this uh, vertex correction gamma here. So formally, this diagram should be called the electron, electronic self-energy in the GW gamma approximation or uh, the method, but the gamma is just way too hard to compute. So uh, so usually what people do is just approximate the gamma to be a bunch of delta functions, which is basically one. So if we put one in the formism, then we will come to the uh, electron self-energy within the GW approximation. So it's a, a very uh, uh, 
it's not simple, but it's uh, straightforward to be written as uh, in a formal way as e, uh, the sigma equals i gw. And that's actually the origin of the GW approximation. It's uh, it's uh, not an acronym of any words. It's actually G means Green's function and W means Green column interaction. So uh, if we approximate the sigma in this way, the electron part of the self energy, then uh, we can see how we get the uh, quasi particle excitation energy, which is actually what we want if you want to plot a GW level band structure. So we can solve the Dyson's equation, which is, I can write it in the eigenvalue equation form. So it will look like this. This will be the equation that we'll be solving. So the first term is uh, coming from the uh, single particle non-interacting type of uh, Hamiltonian that I put all the kinetic external potential and the Hartree potential terms in this H naught. And uh, then we have this complicated convolution integral uh, between the sigma self-energy operator and the quasi-particle wave function. So on the right-hand side, we will get the quasi-particle excitation energy and the uh, wave function. So uh, here we see that uh, for the non-locality part, uh, the wave function here takes on the R prime indices and it will be integrated out. And the frequency dependence need to be taken on the quasi-particle excitation energy. And I think Professor Justino mentioned already, it's kind of a self-consistent uh, uh, loop thing, uh, but we are not doing that, but uh, this is what it should be. And we, we are able to achieve that uh, in, the, uh, in the theory. And you'll be able to do that in the practice this afternoon. So uh, when we compare this GW eigenvalue equation uh, with the Cochem DFT uh, 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 eigenvalue equation, we'll see that they are similar and uh, but they are different. So the difference is coming from this blue terms. And in DFT, the whole self-energy effect, the complicated non-local effect, as well as the frequency dependence, uh, self-energy is being approximated by this exchange correlation potential. So this, uh, uh, this is uh, what we call the VXC. So that is the biggest difference between the two level of theory that you can see. And in practice, we can nowadays, uh, for a few decades, we are able to do the ab initial GW computations. And uh, let's take a look at what we need in order to, to do that. So uh, first, the Green's function, uh, uh, it's also a non-local and frequency dependent quantity, can be written as, uh, can be computed as actually using the wave functions coming from some theories and the eigenvalues come from some theories as a starting point. So these are actually yearly taken as DFT, take DFT as input. And another important ingredient, so we have G now. So another important ingredient is the W, which is also, you can see, non-local and frequency dependent. And uh, this can be computed from the uh, bare Coulomb interaction. So this is screen Coulomb interaction. This is a bare Coulomb interaction. So for the bare Coulomb interaction, it's just simply one over, one over R form. And for the screen Coulomb interaction, so we need to screen it with this uh, non-local and frequency dependent, again, the dielectric, inverse dielectric matrix. So uh, for the inverse dielectric matrix, usually what people do is to compute it within the so-called random phase approximation, just a name. So what it does, as we'll see, is that the uh, uh, dielectric matrix will be computed from the polarizability within the RPA approximation. And the polarizability can actually be computed from the Green's function, again, to going back to here. So now we see actually within this full, it's not within this GW approximation formalism that if we have the wave function and eigenvalues, we'll be able to do the calculation actually. So this is what the GW method does for the ab initial GW does uh, in practice. So uh, commonly the GW self energy will be constructed with a DFT starting point. And uh, uh, you may notice that there are different functionals that can give you different uh, uh, starting point and will that change the results? We, we will come back to that point, but pretty much if the starting point wave function is good enough, it doesn't change the re result much. So what we need really is that uh, we use the DFT starting point and we use their eigenvalues and wave functions to construct G and W. And, when, when, and, and with, with G and W, we can actually construct sigma 
and compute its diagonal matrix elements. So its diagonal matrix elements would be uh, seen, or say the diagonal matrix and minus the VXC part together would be seen as a many body correction to the DFT eigenvalues. So uh, one important thing to be noted uh, in terms of the calculation and in practice is that these terms involve sum over bands. So the, the Green's function will in principle go to infinity, but in, in, in the best case scenario in practice, it will go to the full Hilbert space, which is still quite a lot. So we usually take a cutoff for convergence and uh, that number of bands is usually hundreds of thousands for a good convergence uh, in practice. There are other GW method that can partially avoid the sum over bands. For example, the Sternheimer GW developed here and also the West code uh, by Professor Julia Gali. So just uh, one flavor of the GW that uh, in the perturbation theory sense that we do, uh, Berkeley GW does the sum over bands approach. So uh, here are uh, typical results of uh, GW quasi-particle band, band gap. So in some sense, it's kind of solved the, uh, uh, the DFT band gap issue or say the quotient DFT band gap issue. So uh, let me explain this plot a little bit. So uh, the way to look at it is that the horizontal axis is the experimentally measured band gap. And uh, the, the, the vertical gap, uh, sorry, the vertical axis is a theoretical band gap. So here we did a calculation or uh, many people did many calculation in the past for many materials. And we are just labeling some of them. So, uh, so they go as a pair. So the, the one uh, red dot correspond to one blue cross. So uh, if the, there is a theory that is so accurate that gives exactly the same result as a as the experiment then the dot that the results the, uh, the theory calculation should lie exactly on this diagonal line so then we see that we use dft lda cosine band gap to, to to do the band gap calculation uh pretty much it's being underestimated by quite a lot in cases, of, uh, in some cases, few electron volts. So that's actually pretty off. But if we use the GW uh, quasi-particle theory, we can see much better improvement and the band gap is pretty much lying uh, on the diagonal lines. So this, this shows that uh, it's important to capture the self-energy effect and also tells you that the band gap is actually a quasi-particle. It's an excited states property, yeah. So uh, a little thing to notice that for LDA, some materials can, well, as they should be a uh, semiconductor that uh, LDA can give you metallic behavior. So this is also important to notice that the GW method is also able to fix that. Okay, so uh, with the GW band structure, okay, that's the kind of the first step. Uh, if you want to do a optical absorption. So now we're going to see how we compute the uh, optical absorption in the many-body perturbation theory approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, the widely adopted approach is called the GW beta superior equation or GW BSE approach. And in general, if you shine light into a semiconductor, you would, from the single particle picture, you would excite one electron from the valence band to conduction band and leave a hole. So uh, that's it if you are dealing with a single particle theory. But in practice, when you excite the electron hole, so they have opposite charge. So they actually can interact with each other through Coulomb interaction. So that creates more complications and actually can change your optical spectrum a lot. So, uh, so this uh, is what we're gonna do. So what, we're gonna do is to solve the GW beta solid equation. And what it does is that the electron and hole, the free electron hole, when they are interact via the Coulomb interaction, they will form a new excitation called exciton. It's a two particle uh, excitation. So it's kind of a, uh, it's like a hydrogen atom, but uh, one positive, one negative charge, but it can be more complicated in the material. So the two particle uh, uh, excitation involve one quasi electron and quasi hole. And what it really means is that the free electron hole pairs for the direct transition, the free electron hole pairs at the different part of the brain zone can interact with each other and scatter into each other. And they will form new eigenstates of the two particle effective Hamiltonian that are the excitons. 
So the equation we're going to solve is the beta sub beta equation. And for each x times state, we really labeled as s. So the uh, eigenvalue equation looks like this. So the first term is just the conduction band energy minus the valence band energy. So that's kind of the free electron transition. So if we don't consider the interactions at all, that would be the solution, which is a non-interacting, non-electron hole interacting picture of the absorption. But uh, as I mentioned, that the electron and hole would interact, then the free electron hole pair can scatter into each other. And that is, that is being represented by the second term here. So the basis we take our free electron uh, block band basis, which is your uh, DFT, in practice, the DFT uh, band basis. So we have valence band, the conduction band uh, at each K point that can be scattered to another pair of free electron hole pair. And they are interacting through this uh, electron hole kernel. And then you will have the excitation energies uh, uh, as a solution, eigenvalue solution to your equation. So uh, here, uh, the omega s is the excitation energy of the uh, uh, excitons or the solutions. And uh, the a s uh, as a function of v and ck uh, represents the uh, exciton wave function in the quasi-particle basis. So uh, we have this wave function in the quasi-particle basis, and we know what the block basis are. Actually, we can uh, also compute the electron sorry, exciton wave function in real space, which is uh, written in this form. So uh, it's just, you can do a lot of analysis with it. And uh, here I'm just showing uh, that how to understand that. And we'll notice that this uh, uh, exciton wave function in real space is really a two particle thing. There's a position indices of electron and position indices of hole. So it tells you the uh, amplitude of finding the wave function when one electron is here and hole is at a different place. So, okay, so here is the general equation. Now the problem is how are we gonna uh, do approximation to this kernel electron and hole because we know everything else already. So this is so-called, this is a kernel within the GWBSC approach is called the uh, GWBSC kernel because the kernel actually uses the GW self energy here. So the kernel can be written as a functional derivative of, of some interacting term. Uh, to the Green's function is pretty much the Hartree term plus a sigma. And noting that we are using the GW approximation to sigma. So uh, this BSE uh, equation is at the GW level, actually. So uh, so it, it is pretty, mu pretty much just a bare Coulomb interaction and the screen Coulomb interaction. So we will, we will, we'll be able to compute their matrix elements and solve this uh, eigenvalue problem. So here is some results of the optical absorption of silicon. Uh, let's take a look at how we compute that first. So we can compute uh, the optical absorption of a material on the semiconductor through the imaginary part of the dielectric function, which is directly related to the optical absorption. So uh, uh, in one of the lecture, you actually have seen the, uh, uh, for example, in a single particle theory, that you will have the energy difference, which is just the band gap, and it will compute the uh, dipole matrix element from valence to conduction band. So here, since we're dealing with the axon solutions, so uh, we will be able to, we will need to compute the, uh, uh, the excitation, the, sorry, the uh, uh, moment, sorry, the optical uh, absorption matrix element, the velocity matrix element between the ground state uh, and an excited exciton state. And also the energy dependence is, uh, in, instead of the non-interacting band-to-band -band transition, it's actually the exciton excitation energy. So this gives us a new uh, interacting electron hole picture uh, the dielectric function at turn two for absorption. So here, here is the results. Okay, so you are actually you will be able to re reproduce these results this afternoon. So uh, uh, this is the absorption spectrum of silicon, and uh, the black dots are experiment, and uh, the blue lines are the non-interacting absorption calculated on top of a GW band structure. So that means we have, the G, we have the band structure correct, but we don't have the electron hole interaction. Then we see that the spectral shape, does, uh, it's pretty good, but it does not fully agree with the experiment. And when you compute the, uh, uh, the, the absorption with the interacting electron hole kernel, 
we'll see that spectrum, the red curve, agrees pretty nicely with experiment. So this shows the importance of the electron hole interaction in the optical absorption process. Okay, so in the next, I'm gonna give you uh, one example. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper in this example to, 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 to give you an example, just to see uh, the, the, the capability of the GW and GWBSC method and how we can use and interpret the results. So uh, the example shown here is uh, the monolayer molybdenum disulfide, and it is a direct band gap semiconductor that attracts a lot of attention uh, in the past 10 uh, or more years. So, um, so, uh, so here is a band structure of this 2D material. The blue dashed line is actually the DFT band structure, and the red solid curves are the GW band structure. So we see it opens up the gap a lot and the change changes the relative position of the band energy as well as the band width. So this, this is the typical GW band structure versus DFT band structure. So you will see that the band structure actually can be changed a lot here. The correction is as large as one electron volt. Um, I want to mention that in this paper, uh, it also mentions that convergence is an important issue. I mean, it's typical in a, a standard GW calculation uh, with the, the, the band, uh, sum over band approach. So I just give you a sense of uh, how much convergence effort we need. So the first plot is uh, uh, the band gap at M point uh, as a function of number of bands you need to go into the summation. So we see that you can go to thousands or 10,000 in this case. Um, and the other convergence parameter is this ES, where ES is the energy cutoff for the dielectric matrix. So we also see that uh, it converges slowly with that number too. So this gives you a sense of the important uh, issue of the convergence. For example, if you're using few tens of bands or hundreds of bands, you may be off by half an electron volt. So uh, uh, you need to be very careful in terms of computing GW uh, calculation. But I don't want to scare you because uh, first of all, this is a 2D materials, which is way harder to converge in terms of number of bands. If you're dealing with a bulk, it will be much easier because uh, the important quantity is not the number of bands, it's actually the cutoff energy that you can go up to. So if you are dealing with a bulk, you have much smaller unit cell, you don't need that many bands. Um, so, uh, uh, and also on the second note is that we have been developing uh, quite a few convergence techniques that can significantly speed up these kinds of uh, uh, summation and sampling. So uh, now the GW calculation is, and especially with the computing, power that uh, it's uh, it's not that big of a deal and uh, actually Mara will talk a little bit more about that in his talk. Okay so now we have the GW band structure we can compute the BSC spectrum the optical spectrum that uh, there are a lot of experimental research on this. So this is a computed uh, 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 absorption spectrum uh, converted to absorbance into the materials and the blue, sorry, the green curves are the BSC results, which captures the electron hole interaction and the, the uh, axitonic effects. And the red curve is the uh, in, in non-interacting absorption based on GW band structure. So you see how different they are. The axitonic effects actually are pretty much, pretty strong in 2D material because of a lack of a screening because you have a lot of vacuum. So the Coulomb interaction is actually pretty strong in 2D material that can completely change your uh, results. So I wanna add a note that if you compute the absorption spectrum using the static version of DFT, for example, just doing the band-to-band -band transition, then it is pretty much this curve, but shift back down. So uh, to somewhere where the DFT gap is. So you see that it just completely missed the feature. So also in order to capture uh, the important features and compare to experiments, actually, you see for the optical absorption, it's a two-step thing. You first need the GW, a correct GW band structure. Then you need 
to compute the electron hole interactions to give you the axtonic states and axtonic effects that give you the absorption. So that is the two step thing. So, uh, so here we have seen tightly bound axotonic states, so labeled as A and B peak, uh, the same as, as experiment. And uh, we have seen strong absorbance of 20% at the axotonic excitation energy. So this is pretty strong. That means 20% of light will be absorbed. And uh, in this work, uh, the authors have done the uh, electron hole, sorry, electron phono interaction calculation, which is just to compute the, uh, the, the broadening of the peak due to electron phono uh, interactions at different temperatures and put it back into the absorption curve. Then we see uh, uh, much uh, less feature curve, but agrees pretty nicely with the experiment. So this uh, work just shows that the importance to capture both the band, band structure right, band gap right, as well as the uh, electron hole interaction right, if you want to do a uh, comparison to experiment. So uh, we can also look at the uh, solution of the BSE Hamiltonian of this 2D uh, MLS2 system. So here uh, is a plot of these uh, uh, resulting eigenvalues. So there will be discrete states, axitonic states, and the red uh, axitonic states are bright, which means that they are optically active. And the blue ones are dark, so that means that you won't be able to see that uh, in an optical experiment. So we see that there is a very rich structure and it's very different from the 2D heterogenic model. And the difference is coming from the rich behavior of the dielectric functions in 2D in the real material, 2D materials. And also we can look at their wave function. So here's the axon wave function plotted in K space. We see the 1S state is pretty much a sphere and we see 2S states have a nodal structure and different phase as well as other 2S, 3D, 3P, and 4F states. So there's really a lot of interesting physics that can be explored within the GW and GW sub equation approach. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the self-consistent issue because uh, uh, when we uh, doing our workshop, uh, many people who are new to GW, they will ask, okay, whether your results will be dependent on that and whether we can do a self-consistency and so on. So uh, uh, we can do self-consistency and there are different flavors of self-consistency. And um, I need to, uh, uh, let me introduce the notation in the community. So when you read the literature, you know what they mean. So the notation that for the G and W, uh, we can sometimes put the uh, subscript for it. For, for example, we call them GNWN. What N and M means uh, is that how many iteration step the calculation has been uh, has gone through in each of the individual quantity G and W. So the mostly used one uh, and also mostly uh, seen in the literature are the G not W not G zero W zero calculation means that it's a one shot calculation. We don't iterate at all. We just take what DFT gives us uh, the wave function and the eigenvalues, and we do the calculation one time. So this is usually pretty good and probably gives the best results of the calculation. And if you do self-consistency, then things may become more trickier. So um, one important note, take away, I, I hope that I put it here, is that uh, if you do self-consistency in G, it's probably fine. But if you do self-consistency self in W, it typically will worsen the results. Uh, quite a lot. And uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, so if you do self-consistent in W for semiconductor, usually what you see is that the band gap keep increasing, keep increasing. And the reason is that uh, every time you replace uh, the DFT quasi-particle energy by the GW quasi-particle energy in the formism in both the uh, Green's function as well as in the dielectric matrix. Uh, okay, here I'm talking about about W, so in the dielectric matrix ca calculation, you are giving it a bigger and bigger band gap. When you have a bigger band gap, it has less screening, which is uh, uh, which just uh, 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 keeps giving you bigger and bigger band gap. So, uh, but why if we use the zero step W, it can give a pretty good results usually compared to ex experiment. There, that is because there's a known error cancellation in this type of calculation. 
And because your LDA is typically has a smaller band gap, but if you were to use, uh, for example, beta subject equation generated band gap, which includes the opening up of the band gap and the reducing of the excitation energy due to electron hole interaction, it kind of vaguely speaking gives you a uh, error cancellation. So that's why people really, uh, people really don't iterate on W. So if you iterate on G, uh, on G so uh, one of the uh, simplest approaches to do the eigenvalue self consistency, that means I have a new set of GW quasi particle energy. I just put it back in the G Green's function, and I would assume the DFT wave function is good enough at this level. So I just leave them the same so I can do a few iteration to see how things converge. So that's why it's common to see that to see in the literature you have GNW0 means the G has been iterated for n times or GW0 meaning that the G has been iterated till convergence. So there are scenarios, sorry. There are scenarios that the quasi-particle wave function, the DFT wave functions are off. So in that case, it may be a good idea to update your wave functions at the GW level. And that is called the eigenvector self-consistency GW. So uh, you can understand uh, it that way. If the wave function, the DFT wave function, if it's not close enough to the true wave function, true quasi particle wave function, the uh, self-energy or self-energy minus VXC operator can have a very big off diagonal matrix elements. So that means you are, wave function not the eigenstates. So in that case, you can actually diagonalize this matrix and that can give you a new wave function. So uh, this can also be done. And there are other uh, ways of doing uh, self-consistency. Uh, uh, for example, the quasi-particle self-consistency, I would refer to the uh, Professor Van Schiffgar's paper. So just so you know that there are different flavors of self-consistencies and we can do it at a different level. It really depends on like a physical base, for example, whether your wave function is good enough, for example. So here I'm showing you an example of the eigenvector self-consistency, self-consistent GW, which means that the wave function need to be updated in order to get good results. So here is a recent calculation, the GW BSE calculation of the X-ray absorption spectra of liquid water. And uh, here's a, a X-ray spectrum. And uh, the black curve, sorry, the black dots are taken from the experiments. And if you do a direct G0, W0 calculation, that gives you this blue curve, which is pretty much look like the experiment, but not so close. So the authors here has done a alpha diagonal calculation. Oops. So the plotted map here is uh, the matrix of uh, actually the matrix of sigma minus VXC. So that tells you uh, how off or how not off the wave functions are. So uh, if the wave function is very good, then you should see if the DFT wave function is very good, then you should see pretty much zero matrix elements on the off diagonals. But in this case, liquid water, we see that the off diagonals actually are pretty dominant. That means the wave functions are uh, definitely not good enough. So the, uh, we have performed the diagonalization on the matrix and get a new set of wave function. That means it has been updated at the eigenvalue level. And that actually improves significantly the results. So the black curve is coming out from these new eigenvector uh, updated wave uh, GW calculation. So this shows that sometimes in, in cases, the self-consistent can be very important and it actually can give you good results, you, but you need to understand what is going on there. Okay, so uh, I think up till now, I've done my introduction to the GW and GW beta subject equation introduction. And then in the next, I'm gonna uh, introduce a, a different topic, which is but closely related to the GW method and the electron phonon school. That is, uh, uh, the, the, I'm gonna briefly introduce the uh, recent development of the GW perturbation theory. So uh, one thing we have already seen that the GW method can give you the correction to the band gap, band structure, and uh, the uh, GW BSC approach can give you the correction 
of the electron hole interactions and give you the right absorption spectrum. But the theme of this school is on electron phonon coupling. So a natural question to ask is that can we uh, 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 can we actually do a GW level of calculation of the electron phonon matrix elements, which nowadays mostly done at the DFT level through density functional perturbation theory. So now we are able to do that. And let me uh, 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 tell you how. So uh, as I mentioned that uh, for the true quasi-particle excitation in materials, it uh, is interacting complicated in a complex way with other uh, electrons. Uh, so what we are we need to see or say the true quasi-particle uh, phonon coupling is that when we have this type of interaction in quasi-particles and when the lattice is oscillating, how this quasi-particle gonna respond to that. So that's the uh, electron phonon coupling that we talk about. So uh, you have done a lot of practices, you have seen a lot that the DFPT is very powerful for phonon and also especially for electron phonon coupling properties that give you pretty very rich physics. But we also know that uh, DFT level theory is inadequate for uh, many electron correlations and uh, uh, it's not a true potential seen by the quasi particle. So the goal here is to develop a different theory uh, at the GW level uh, that is within the linear response approach, which means it's the same spirit as the DFPT that everything can be computed within a single unit cell. So we hope to develop that and at the GW level. So uh, that's what we did uh, and we call it the GW perturbation theory. So uh, this theory can compute the electron phonon matrix element at the GW level in a single unit cell uh, of all transitions if you want. And it can capture the many electron correlation effects in the electron phonon coupling, in each individual electron phonon coupling matrix elements. So a uh, little bit about the theory is that for the electron phonon coupling, we're talking about for the true quasi-particle excitations, uh, the electron phonon interaction would include the first order derivative of the self energy to the ionic displacement. So in DFT, this would be dVSCF, and at the GW level of theory, this is a d sigma dr. So, uh, so similar to uh, to what we did, the correction to the band energy at the GW in the GW theory, we can actually do the GW correction to the electron phonon matrix elements, which we have already seen that they are the building blocks to all the microelectronic electron phonon theories. You can compute superconductivity, you can compute the temperature dependence of a band structure, and so on. So they all based on the electron phonon matrix elements. Uh, so this electron phonon matrix element at the GW level can be derived from the matrix segment at the DFT level, which we already have, by taking off contributions from the first order change in the change correlation potential, and by adding on the first order change in the self-energy operator. So we can construct this operator and we can compute all these off-diagonal matrix segments, and we do the replacement and we get the GW level of electron phonon matrix segments. So similar to a DFT starting point, we, we also need a DFPT starting point. And we will need the DFPT to give us the DFT level electron phonon matrix segment. We need the first order potential for the exchange correlation potential. And we need the first order change in the wave function uh, in the linear response theory for both valence and conduction bands. So with these ingredients, we can actually construct the GW level of matrix segments. And I'm gonna show uh, a quick example of um, how it looks and how it behaves. So we have applied this GW perturbation theory to a superconductor. Uh, it's uh, called the potassium doped barium bismuth oxide discovered in 1988 and with the highest TC of 32 Kelvin uh, at its optimal doping. So it has a pretty simple cubic uh, crystal structure and the band structure is actually pretty friendly to the computation uh, people like us because it's just one single band. And uh, we can compute the electron phonon matrix elements throughout the brain zone across different phonon branches scattered by different phonon mode in, in the phonon brain zone as well. So we did that. And here is just a slice of that huge matrix uh, that you have computed already. But uh, here we do it at the DFPT level and the GWPT level. Uh, 
So this really shows the power of the linear response theory that you can access every point of the brain zone at the same cost of a single unit cell calculation. So we see that the distribution of a particular slice in, in, in the big matrix is non-uniform. And also the renormalization, renormalization is non-uniform. So we really need the information across the full brain zone. That means we really need a linear, linear response theory for accurate description of electron phone interactions. Another thing to note that if you look at the color bar that uh, the values are quite different. So uh, it seems that the electron phonon coupling can be enhanced a lot due to the magnetron correlation effect. Um, so with the computer emission segment, we can actually construct the lambda and the computer TC and so on. So here uh, is a TC computed using uh, 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 the uh, Macmillan Allen Dines formula that uh, Roxana has introduced uh, uh, two days ago. And we can uh, compute its TC in this form and we are taking a uh, mu star value of 0.16. So here we see the phase diagram of the doping dependence in this X in the formula as a, uh, versus a superconducting uh, TC uh, in this phase diagram. So uh, here the squares and the other symbols are experiment. And we see experimentally has seen that there's a half dome structure doping dependence in this material. And we can compute the TC using both GWPT and DFPT theory. And if we look at the GWPT results, we see that it agrees pretty nice, pretty nicely with the experiment, not only in the magnitude, but also capture the doping trend. Whereas if you're doing a DFPT calculation, the numbers are here. So that means uh, if you use a DFPT level theory or DFT level theory for uh, electron phonon coupling in this particularly strongly or say moderately to strongly correlated material, then you will fail to capture its true electron phonon coupling strength. Okay, uh, and uh, now actually we're working on uh, combining uh, Berkey GW and EPW, and we can actually uh, compute many important phenomena at different levels, and we can see the difference and we can learn more about the physics. So, uh, so then I actually bring back, for example, take as an example, the fan Migdal self-energy. So this is the electron phonon self-energy and we can see where we can improve and how we can improve. So uh, first, uh, this is a, a electron phonon self-energy for the electron propagator G, uh, we can compute, it's pretty much just the eigenvalues. And uh, uh, we have, uh, in the standard EPW calculation, you where you take the input from DFT, you will have the DFT eigenvalues. And now we can actually, if you want, we can do the GW eigenvalues. So that gives you a, a, a GW level pro electron propagator. And also for this uh, electron phonon matrix elements, we can also do at the DFT level versus GW level. And uh, since we don't really uh, consider the vertex correction, so it's just one. And another important thing that I've been asked a lot is that uh, how do we make corrections to D, the phonon propagator? But if you think a little bit more, is that the origin of the phonon propagator is which, which is uh, uh, coming from the total energy of the system. And we are computing uh, the phonon frequencies, which can give you the phonon propagators uh, using a ground state theory that describes it's pretty well the total energy of the material to our knowledge. So actually for me, I don't think there's a need to update this one at the first level. Uh, and actually it's pretty good already. So if we wanna uh, further consider the correction, we can further compute the electron phonon self energy to the phonon mm, frequency and add it there, but it's a natural, uh, extra next step thing. So uh, the most explicit thing to be updated can be the uh, electron propagator G and the electron phonon matrix element, small g. So here is, is an example of a GW level electron phonon phenomenon calculation with a combination of EPW and Berkey GW. So we have computed a uh, spectral function coming from electron phonon coupling in an uh material. And this spectrum, very smooth spectrum is actually coming from with the help of the power of EPW sampling millions of points. So that gives you this uh, 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 very smooth spectrum. And uh, this uh, four dimension kink actually can also be observed in experiment. And uh, again, we see a good agreement between the GW level matrix element versus DFT level. 
and also uh, noted that uh, this calculation is actually done with Abinit as the DFPT starting point, and also the DFT level of theory is actually calculated uh, uh, at the, using the Abinit code instead of the Quantum Espresso code. So that just uh, give you a, a taste of uh, how things are going and uh, uh, what type of calculation and uh, uh, entire probability among code can already be done at the current stage. Okay, uh, this would be the end of my talk. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the org organizer. Thank you for your attention. And I'd like to introduce uh, the Berkeley GW developer group leader, Professor Stephen G. Louis, who is not here uh, for the school, uh, but we have other people here at this school, in particular, uh, Dr. Jack Dislip and uh, Dr. Mauro Delbin, who will talk more about the Berkeley GW code uh, in the following. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. I sure. was wondering about the water uh, matrix challenge. Mm -hmm. the matrix challenge. So it seems that the ones that are the worst are the off the argument just for conduction because they don't seem to be okay. Is there a reason for that? Uh, um, we, we can see a problem out here, and the whites are more in the conduction. Yeah, it's actually, uh, uh, yes, that's a good point. Uh, I don't see a direct physical reason for that. It shows that, that seems that the conduction band is much worse. Uh, I don't have a direct physical understanding of that. Um, but this gives you the um, uh, behavior of the system, I would say. And uh, the occupied states are, if I want to argue, vaguely is that the occupied state is more related to the density part, which may behave better. Uh, but I take that as a vague argument. Yeah. Yeah. So the overall behavior of the uh, uh, self-energy correction to the eigenvalue will lead to uh, more local characters of the wave function. So uh, that is known. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, could you explain why I mean, this show with the name of the renal validation of the electron funnel um, the matrix, which takes us and it will not be yet. So, could you tell me why they view have the last the renalization, uh, by the way, from the collection uh, and the center of the region? Here, okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is actually plotted on the uh, absolute scale. So, uh, so the Fermi surface is around this circle on the two plots. So uh, this does not directly tell you how much it's being renormalized in the percentage uh, in the percentage wise, but it's in our paper. So if uh, you ask for a reason, it is indeed non-uniform, and the reason is because of the change of character. That if you go to different part of the brain zone, you actually going along different part of the bands and there are more complex characters when you're approaching gamma point and the different uh, different characters would tend to give you different self energy corrections in general to that to the transit or uh, okay. the development because it's not released yet, but it will be released. Uh, so we're making plans to, to see what would be a good time to do the release. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is just about the other question about uh, your thesis for a while. Um, all the ions in the system are, are quite heavy. So if you would go by the unbalanced formula, you would have lambda and omega log. So omega log will be relatively uh, low because the ions are quite uh, heavy. So your lambda must be weak. Okay. Yeah, well. So, and what I want to ask is if lambda approaches to 
Yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, I didn't show lambda, uh, maybe I should. Uh, so the lambda at this optimal doping is 1.14. So it's an okay range for the perturbation theory to still working. And uh, it's not all heavy atoms too. We have oxygen and it's actually those high frequency oxygen mode that give you the strongest coupling in this particular case. Yeah, yeah. Um, considering you put now a very good description of like projective chain, um, are you do you think that you're able to start a order parameter like S sub minus or D? Um, um yes, theory? yes, um, uh, we actually have done that. Uh, um, if uh, and I was actually discussing with Roxana, and uh, uh, yeah, you are you're able to do that, it's just a little bit extra work in the code. Okay, so I may have to refer you to the, the, the reference paper to look at more details on the formism, but the rough idea is that uh, the results I'm showing today is a single shot G not W not PT calculation. So what that means is that we just do a single shot construction using the DFT quantities and DFPT quantities, uh, the same as a to the level as a G not W not correction to a band structure. So in principle, you can further update the Green's function and so on, but just cre create more complications. So uh, for now, it's a one-shot calculation, but you can extend to more self-consistent too. Oh, sure. Uh, so the effective masses can be changed, uh, but I would think it mostly probably gonna happen if you really have a complex character. Uh, that means, uh, as I just mentioned, different character would have a different self-energy correction. So that may change your coverage of the band. And uh, in this MOS2 case, you see uh, pretty much a rigid shift, but it's not only a rigid shift. For example, if you look at the top of the K points of the bands here, the effective masses are changed. And some other changes are includes the overall bandwidth of one band and of few bands, the, the, the full uh, manifold of bands. So they will all be, in general, be different coming out from the GW calculations. And usually they, uh, usually, they agree better to experiments compared to DFT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one final question is how is the, 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 the ratio of oh. Yeah, uh, good question. So, uh, here we just do a uh, change of the occupation, which means adding a compensating background here. Uh, it works well because uh, the band is pretty nice uh, in character and in shape. So it's pretty much a rigid band behavior. So in some more complicated case that we are working on right now, I tend to use virtual crystal approximation. That's just give you more close to a uh, reality situation. But both in general works depend on the system. For this, we just do the rigid shift type. Not rigid shift, but compensating background charge thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, you yes. 
Yes. Uh, that's a very, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, here I put a CDW phase here, charge density wave phase. Uh, this is based on experiment. And yes, I mentioned that uh, uh, DFPT does a pretty good job giving you the total energy, which means it should be able, the DFT level theory should give you the charge density wave. It does, but it's great, but it's not perfect. So your ratio won't be necessarily at the same experiment, but it can give you this transition. Yes. So, so if then if you, if you truly want a more consistent phase diagram, it could be similar to this, but the, the phase boundary may not be, you know, so uh, agreeing so well with experiments. So here we focus on the subjectivity part. So we just plot it and use experimental uh, phase transition here. Um, I would say it's physical. Uh, I don't see a reason why it's not a physical. Uh, it, it, yes, indeed, you have a work function, uh, but these are virtual state and we are talking about the, uh, uh, really, if you look at the exact, any perturbation theory, you would involve, even for DFPT, even if only the charge density matters, the first order wave function, for example, if you think of in the perturbation theory sense, you need to sub over all states that you have defined within your Hilbert space. That means all you can have. But uh, in DFPT, there's another treatment, the Sternheim equation and so on. And here we do, for our purpose, we do some of bands and set up a cutoff. So uh, I think it's, uh, if you ask whether it's physical, my answer is it's physical, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manas.